For any of you who thought the controversy from the 2024 Stronger Men's Conference was kind of all settled over the weekend, well, it's just gotten more messy ever since. In this video, we're going to talk about what has happened since the conference concluded coming up to Wednesday evening, the Wednesday evening church service at James River Church, where Pastor John Lindell calls out Mark Driscoll and calls him to repent of what he calls spreading demonic lies. So there's a lot that has happened over the course of the rest of that weekend and up to today. We're going to talk about all of that, and I want to pull out some lessons for us as followers of Jesus and as church leaders. But before we get to that, if you're new here and you've never met me, my name's Brandon. This channel is called Preach and Lead. The whole purpose of the channel is to help pastors preach faithfully and lead more intentionally. So if that's something that you're interested in, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. And also, I've got a free gift, my way of saying thanks to you for being on this video. If you go to preachandlead.com slash guide, you can get my 10-step guide to writing a sticky sermon. In that, I break down the whole process to go from blank page to finished sermon in less time and to prepare a better message, a message that is transformational. So if you go to preachandlead.com slash guide, you can get your free guide right there. Okay, so we're going to jump into the Wednesday evening service that John Lindell is leading, and in this, he's eventually going to call Mark Driscoll to repent of five different things. Okay, so at this point in the message, um, John is recapping the end of their public discussion. He kind of gave context to what led up to the, the point in which the conference was kind of over with, and now he's recapping the end of the public discussion. So here we're going to jump in at about 12, almost 13 minutes in. Let's see what John says. Mark mentioned that he should have come to me, but acknowledging what happened is not the same as apologizing. Following our platform discussion, Mark and I visited backstage while Pastor Jabe and Shabbat Okay, so just a quick point on this that really, I believe, is the whole crux of this whole situation. Um, the, the point was, they came out, and Mark agreed to do whatever he could to, you know, try and make amends, I guess. But in this, Mark apologized for not coming to John about the issue before Mark went on stage and and talk to the whole conference about it. And while Mark did not apologize for what he said, he did apologize for making it public in the, in the way that he did. Now, what I think is the core issue that has perpetuated this controversy into now something that is causing John to uh, deal with this in a Wednesday evening service at the church that he pastors is that on the stage when they came back together, well, they settled for false peace. Here's an alternative kind of scenario that maybe would have resulted in some better end results. Maybe pastor John should have allowed Mark to finish his message and, and, lay whatever kind of assertions that he was going to make laid out there for everyone to hear, then come back and address it together, but actually address the issue. Instead, what they did was John interpreted what Mark was saying as an attack on him and as a sin against him personally, right? Cause he asserts Matthew 18 in his rebuke of him after he kicks him off stage. So he says, you should have come to me first. And I've already pointed out that this was a public decision and Mark made a public uh, refutation, right? He refuted it publicly. Matthew 18 is against something that someone sins against you personally. You go to them. Okay. So more on that later, because I think some of Matthew 18 does actually apply in this scenario, but not in that moment in the conference. So instead, what they did was... They, John told him to get off stage. Mark leaves the stage. Then they come back. They have a powwow, but they don't actually talk about the actual issue that Mark brought up. So instead, they just let it be, right? 
and they didn't address it. Instead, they were, they were settling for false peace. What if they would have actually addressed the stuff head on? Because when any of us settle for false peace, it always leads to more pain in the future. Not having the difficult conversation that needs to be had always leads to more difficulty in the future. That's true in our relationships with, with family members, with friends, in churches, in businesses, in organizations, in, in whatever element of life, whatever, whatever situation, right? Don't settle for false peace. I believe what they did over the course of the weekend in coming out and not actually addressing the core issue that they had a disagreement about because they didn't want to sow disunity, they settled for false peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They didn't make peace. And the rest of this is going to show that. Let's continue. I spoke. I told Mark, I love you and I want to continue to be your friend. Mark said, well, I've just crapped all over your event. And I said, I still want to be your friend. Mark responded by saying that he loved our family and the church and would never want to hurt us. We suggested having a picture taken that would show us together. Mark insisted that he be the one who posted it first. And you can see it there. And it is obvious that he collabed us on the photo. So it's a post by Mark. The picture was posted shortly after it was taken. At that point, I was thinking that things were settled. When Mark returned to Scottsdale, Arizona, he sent me the following text at 5.10 p.m. Pastor John, it's Mark here. I just landed back in Phoenix. I feel like I'm watching a strange Netflix show I happen to be in. Thank you for 16 years of deep deposits and friendship. I love, appreciate, and respect you very much. My online team is the leading all negative. I'm not responding to anyone or anything, including text. I'm honored to talk about whatever, whenever. I'm genuinely praying James 1, 5 for you and mean that sincerely. I deeply love you and your family and church family and appreciate the maturity and seasoned grace of your response under great pressure. Your character was proven and I'm grateful for you. Okay. Um, he, he tells John, this should have been a clue to John that this wasn't all done, right? Um, John... Or Mark says to John, I'm praying James 1 5 for you. James 1 5 says, Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. One of the things that, that if you're praying for wisdom for someone, that means you disagree with them on the decision that they've made. Now, in prior videos, I've pointed out that I think at best it was unwise to have this performance in a Christian men's conference at best. It was unwise because it's not just about the, the, like what you believe to be the case. And, and he goes into um, why he still stands by the decision to have Alex Magala depart, you know, regardless of his past, why he stands by the decision to have him part of the conference. Okay, but you have to understand it's not just what people like the 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 nature of what you're doing, it's how people perceive it. That's part of it. As a leader, you have to understand and consider how are people going to like see this and respond to this? Does this add any kind of value to what we're doing? Now, in the in the next few minutes of the video, he he kind of outlines different text messages that Mark and his son David had back and forth, and I'm going to skip through that because I want to get to the point where uh, there's a there's a phone conversation between Mark and David, which is John Lindell's son. So there's text messages that go back and forth, starting on Saturday when when Mark got back. Uh, into Arizona from the from the conference, and then there's this phone conversation, and I think it's important to see what is said. To take it a step further, Mark had not only texted my son David, but he called David on Saturday night at 11:37 p.m. and left this voicemail: "Hey, buddy, this is Driscoll. I love you very much. I feel like throwing up and crying. 
I'm very, very sorry. I sent you some text. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say any of that. I'm not going to share any of that. I'm not going to do anything. I love you guys and guys. And I wish I was wrong, but I have my team quadruple check, check it unless they have completely messed up. This is a major crisis for you and James River. And so, yeah, just check your text thread. I CC'd your dad. I'll do anything I can to help. I'm not going to say a word. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to do anything. I've been the guy who is getting melted to the ground. The very last thing I want to do is be anything but a shield to love and protect you guys because I care very much for you and you guys mean the world to me. So I just wanted you to hear it from me that I'm very devastated, very broken heart. I love you guys very much. I'm for you. And if there's anything I can do to help without making things worse, I'm open to that. Know that I feel absolutely terrible and I'm praying. Yeah. And I just really appreciate the way you treated my son and son-in-law. You're a good man, David. I love you, buddy. Thank you. Mark called David again on Monday at 11.25 a.m., but left no message. Given Mark's response to me, I suggested that David should, as a courtesy, return Mark's call, which he did at 12.03 p.m. on Monday. On the call, Mark reiterated what he said in the voicemail on Saturday night. He ended those statements by saying, I am not wrong. He followed that up by saying the follow to date, the following to David. And David, this is as David remembers it. Number one, there is something wrong at James River Church. Number two, the leadership with you, your dad, and your brother is enmeshment. Enmeshment to Mark means that's a group of people, any group that is against Mark or that Mark doesn't agree with. Number three, there is something evil at work in the church. Something is different since the last time I came. There is a mixture of the sinful and the sacred. Number four, the reason that God is still blessing is because of the foundation of grace laid by years of Bible teaching. Number five, and I'm numbering them because these are statements David remembers. David, you need to differentiate. What Mark means by that is you need to separate yourself. And if you don't, James River Church may cease to exist. Number six, this is a word from the Lord for you. This may be the most important moment of your life. Number seven, Brandon is a broken man. The fact he could watch that guy in rehearsal and says, say nothing, says something is wrong. Something is wrong with him. He went on to accuse Brandon of a list of dark sins. But you need, number eight, to differentiate and become the leader of James River Church. This is your fulcrum moment. What kind of person says those things? Okay. Those are major allegations, right? Those are, those are very serious allegations. And you would hope that somebody wouldn't make allegations like that flippantly. And truth be told, like none of us are going to know what the truth is, except for the people who are involved. Now, this is the point in which I believe Matthew 18 can start to be relevant to the situation. It was, I don't believe it was relevant during the conference at all, but now the lead up to this after the conference and now up to here with those kinds of allegations, if they're false, if they're false, Matthew 18 becomes relevant because now there's slander and uh, deceit coming from Mark to them. If what, he is saying is not true, right? And so this is where they start to, to kind of like outline the steps that they're taking to align with Matthew 18. Now, again, pastor John Lindell believes that the whole ordeal 
has relevancy to Matthew 18. Again, I've made that point before. I don't think that's true. But now I can see that. So I'm going to jump to uh, 24 minutes, 2439. Again, you can see this whole uh, whole message linked in the description below. But right now, this is where John is going to respond via text message to Mark. And he's going to talk about how they're moving to step two in Matthew 18 and what is widely you know, considered the, the church discipline kind of uh, framework to follow. And I would agree on you know things that are relevant to it. This is what he says. You can imagine that when David told me what had been said, I immediately wanted to text Mark. At 1.33 p.m., I texted Mark the following, Mark, what in the world? Your call to David was ridiculous. I thought your plan was to, and I'm quoting his last text to me, to be saying nothing and doing nothing but praying. So which is it? Where is your integrity? At 1.34 p.m., Mark responded with this text. I did not call David. He called me. I left a voicemail days ago. What Mark had done at this point was so egregious. Attempting to tear down the leadership of the church. Attempting to create doubt and friction between brothers. Attempting to sow discord between a father and a son. It seems demonic to me. And honestly, it makes me very, very concerned for Mark. At that point, we moved to step two in the Matthew 18 process. Matthew 18, 16. But if you will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Within an hour, I called Dr. Jimmy Evans, the founder of Marriage Today, the Tipping Point Podcast, and the founder and president of XO Marriage. Jimmy Evans, if you do not know him, is one of the finest Christian leaders in the United States of America today. Jimmy had at one time served as a spiritual advisor to Mark. Those I sought counsel from said that Jimmy was very likely the only spiritual advisor that Mark would listen to. Dr. Jimmy Evans called Mark on Monday afternoon and Mark returned his call on Monday evening. Dr. Evans repeatedly told Mark Driscoll that he needed to repent. Each time, all that Mark would say is that Jimmy was a spiritual father to him and a friend that he loved. But Mark was unwilling to repent and still has not repented. As well. Okay. <laughs> I think it's really important to bring up this point. And still has not repented. Well, I think it's really important for us to consider who we invite to speak at our events. He mentioned that many people, whoever he talked to, said that, that Jimmy Evans might be the only spiritual advisor that Mark would listen to, right? Isn't that a isn't that something to like pay attention to? If you've not listened to the rise and fall of Mars Hill and actually considered just what it documents and what it displays during Mark's time at Mars Hill Church in Seattle and consider the fact that Regardless of how many eyewitnesses, how many leaders who served with him, how many church members, how many people who have come up and said, this is my experience with Mark as the lead pastor, and they called him to repentance, they called him to make changes in the way that he led, and instead, Mark to this day has not publicly repented 
or acknowledged his part in any of that. If anything, he has played the victim card. He has he has talked about how this difficulty has come upon was had come upon him and his family as if he had no part to play in it. So when you when you align yourself with certain people who have a tendency to lack accountability and to lack any kind of, you know, ability to receive critique. What, what do you expect? What do you expect? Now, I know many of you watching this might be Mark Driscoll fans. Okay. But don't ignore the history. Now, maybe, maybe he's wiser and now that he's you know older and been around the block a few more times, maybe he's just changed man. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know him personally. But again, as leaders, we have to pay attention to these things. Moving forward, um, we're going to go to about the 29 and a half minute mark where Pastor John Lindell outlines the things that he's calling Mark to repent from. This is what he says. Mark, if you are listening to this message, we love you and it's with a heavy heart that we are calling you to repent. Jimmy Evans has called you to repent. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, Mark, we call on you to publicly repent. We are calling you to publicly repent for refusing to stop the spread of lies regarding Alex Magala, a Christian brother. Mark, we are calling you to publicly repent for sowing disunity in the body of Christ. Mark, we are calling you to publicly repent for covertly trying to divide brothers and making false and slanderous accusations against Brandon Lindell. Mark, we are calling you to publicly repent for trying to create division in the Lindell family, all the while saying you love us. Mark, we are calling you to publicly repent for trying to destroy James River Church through attacking its leadership. Okay, to wrap this up. Three things to consider as pastors and church leaders. Number one, whatever you do, don't settle for false peace. Because as I've already said, when you when you refuse to have a difficult conversation, it only leads to more difficulty in the future. Don't settle for false peace in the church, in your family, with your friendships, in in any realm of life. Like don't settle for false peace. It's fake. The, the, the powwow they had on stage obviously did not actually result in the thing that they were claiming that it was resulting in. We just want to bring unity and all this. No, you, you refuse to have a conversation about the actual issue that you two had between each other. Not between, like, not personally, but like on the decision. And so, so like, have the conversation. How much things, how many things? I'm curious what you think. Would this have been different? Would it, would it have turned out differently if Pastor John would have let Mark finish his message and then they come out, if they were willing to, and discuss the actual stance on both sides in the moment of the conference, instead of, you're done, get off the stage, you disagree with you know a decision that I made, and then, okay, let's come out and let's talk about how much we love each other and not actually talk about the thing that caused the, the riff in the first place. How much would have been different? Would, would this kind of result still be here? Would he have had to use a Wednesday evening service to actually like to, to 
execute church discipline. Like, no one will know, except for God. But maybe, maybe it would have been different if you would have just not settled for false peace. Second thing is, difficult conversations are difficult, especially when it's all public. So to that, we can have plenty of grace and understanding. Difficult conversations are difficult, and that's going to be true in your ministry too. Whether you're a mega church pastor, whether you're a lay leader, whether you're a, a solo pastor of a 75-person church, whatever your story is, wherever you lie in all of this, your context, difficult conversations are really difficult especially when it's all public happening in real time and you don't have time to plan for it. It's, it's difficult. And the third thing, please, 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 leaders, when you are planning an event, consider what you include in them. Consider who you include in them. Okay, like, remember... When, when you just hear silence, silence doesn't equate approval. In the beginning of this, which I didn't show, uh, John points out that, hey, there were plenty of ample time for people to tell me and compl- like e- express concern about the decision that they made you know, after it had happened. No, he said no one came up and complained about what, you know, what, what happened and the, the sword swallowing acrobatic act. Uh, no one no one. No one expressed like a frustration with it. None of the hosts in the in the venue, uh, you know, expressed a frustration with it. Okay, fair. That's fair. However, there was planning meetings. There were all these things. Again, it's not just about what is happening, but it's also about perception too, like what people receive. Communication is not just about what you say; it's about what people re- receive and hear. Right. What you say, you could say something, you know, anybody who's married knows anybody who's had any relationship knows that you can say something with a tone and what's communicated is far different than just the words that were said. Right. Fair. Okay. Silence doesn't equate approval. So when you're preparing, ask people for genuine feedback, ask people for genuine feedback. Hey, what do you think about this? Do you think this is a good idea? Do you think this is wise? And then also, like, again, who you include in them. John, you invited Mark Driscoll. Knowing full well who he is and that he's not afraid of controversy. And, like, you just, you just know. So is your decision. Whether it was wise or not is up for debate. And I'm sure by plenty of people. So at this point, I'm curious, what do you think? Should Mark Driscoll repent in response to what Pastor John Lindell has laid out? Let me know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you.